Well, good, good morning, everybody. Welcome to our first Aliens Among Us Q&A seminar. I'm Andrew Cox, the CEO of the Invasive Species Council. Before we proceed, it's my honor to acknowledge the traditional owners on the lands we meet and have this seminar. For those of you in Australia, um, I'm on Gandangara and Darug land in the Blue Mountains. So please take a moment to acknowledge the country you're on and to pay your respects to the elders past and present. So this series, Aliens Among Us, it's a series where we explore the complex and chaotic world of invasive species in Australia. How did they get here? Are they harming our native ecosystems, plants and wildlife? And what's been done to repair the damage they have caused? So we want you to be stimulated and we want you to help us ask the questions. This is the first one in the series, so we'd love your feedback about how this goes. So today we're using Zoom. You can't see all, our, all the other participants, but we had over 90 people registering for this event. It's fantastic and already about 30 or 40 of the joined. So the numbers are rising as I speak. Now before, when you were registering for this session, people could ask questions and we got quite a few. A lot of questions actually remind us that there's a lot of interest in the broader issue of invasive species. And it's, they, some of them were about other issues that um, our special guest today won't be able to talk about. So we'll, we'll hold those to another time. But there's certainly a few I'll, I'll cover off as we go. We're recording this event and we're going to place the event online afterwards so you can catch up later, share it with your friends. And hopefully over time we'll have a series of Aliens Among Us um, special seminars. <clears throat> now, why do we pick the title Aliens Among Us? We did it because this book here of the same title, written by a Canadian author, Leslie Anthony, and he was quite happy for us to use this name. And this is about the invasive species that have taken over many countries in the world. And in Canada, he certainly did a good job, and Leslie Anthony, explaining what, what it's doing to transform nature in Canada. So I hope you enjoy this. And let's get on with our first guest today. Now, today's guest is Pete Minard. I first met Pete in Melbourne at the Nat Natural History Bar on Collins Street in Melbourne two years ago. It's, uh, I recommend the bar because it's lots of stuffed animals. It feels a bit like a museum, but it has a pretty casual atmosphere. So Dr. Pete Minard is an historian of colonial science and environmental history. He did his PhD on the history of the zoological acclimatization in Victoria. And he's published extensively on 19th century acclimatization movement and invasive species more generally. He's currently an honorary research fellow at La Trobe University and an honorary research fellow at Melbourne Museum. And he's written a book, All Things Harmless, Useful and Ornamental. I read this book when it came out two years ago and it's certainly worth a great read. And that's why he makes a perfect guess for our inaugural Aliens Among Us seminar series. So this book's about the rise of a worldwide movement of acclimatization societies. And in particular, in the outpost of Victoria in the period 1860 to 1890. Today, the environment of Australia is fundamentally changed due to the fervent work of the acclimatization societies. Some changes like the spread of deer are still unfolding. This is an important part of the natural history of Australia. And it's my great honor today to introduce Pete Minard. I'll just bring Pete into our screen. Good. Hi, Pete. How are you going? Hey. Hi, everyone. Hi, Andrew. Great, Pete. Well, thanks, thanks for writing this book. You've done a great honour to all of us to explain really the acclimatisation societies. And uh, I learned a lot myself thinking I understood what the acclimatisation societies were all about, but it's actually much more complex. So, Pete, tell me, why on earth did you write a book about acclimatisation societies? Um, 
kind of a deep fascination of how we come to an idea of what does and does not belong in Australia and, you know, what line, when do we call something invasive, when is something a domestic animal, um, what native animals do we value, how did we come to value native animals and just kind of, and also like um, on a practical sense, uh, the acclimatization depot, which has now become Melbourne Zoo, is, was right next to my office. So I was visually confronted with it on a day-to-day basis of, well, who are these people? And then I wanted to write something where you could look out the window and see the results. So I guess if a majority of you looked out a window now, you could probably see a sparrow. You might see an Indian miner. If you looked in a creek, it wouldn't be that hard to find a trout. So it's kind of a total transformation in the Australian environment. It's so ubiquitous that a lot of us don't even see it anymore. We just think this is how Australia is. Yeah, as a movement, they've been highly successful. So before we start talking about the climatization societies in Australia, this movement has its origins outside of Australia. Where exactly did it come from? And what was the original thinking of, of this, this burgeoning movement in the 1800s? Uh, sure. Um, it had its origins in France and in England, who had the um, two first societies. And they were looking to kind of use acclimatization to increase their imperial control and do things like um, introduce emus and kangaroos to Algeria, um, introduce eucalypts all over the world to kind of alter the climate. So it's about making parts of their empires productive that weren't so, or also to kind of correct already done environmental damage. So which which countries had acclimatization societies? Was it all over the world or just... Uh, mainly Europe and um, so these Australasian colonies, but there was also one in Hong Kong, uh, Imperial Russia, um, parts of Italy, definitely New Zealand, um, but the most prominent ones were within the British and French empires because they were able to enlist... um, the age of basically the British and French navies to move animals around, which made it a lot cheaper and more practical. So was that the goal of each of the societies? Were they all the same in terms of their motives? Um, The British society was a lot more about creating more agricultural products. So yes, they wanted to say introduce Um, antelope but they always thought of them as living in a paddock whereas you look at the ones in the colonies uh, look and say Mauritius Australia New Zealand it was about establishing animals in the wild and yet and in France it was about establishing things in definitely in the colonies yeah okay and this movement um, started to create some interest from Australia. So it seems to me from reading your book, Mr. Edward Wilson seemed to be a critical person in the whole uh, rise of acclimatization in Australia. Tell me about Edward Wilson. Yep. Well, um, Edward Wilson was a kind of a democratic reformer, kind of pro Eureka. Um, he also owned the Argus newspaper. So he was kind of a prominent journalist and editorialist and very much a kind of a liberal social reformer. And he also believed in land reform, so breaking down um, the huge squatter estates into smaller farms. And part of his belief in acclimatisation is, well, what can these smaller farmers farm? And even outside of the farms themselves, how can we help survive colonists, survive on the landscape? So deer, for example, he would be interested in because they provide food, not because they provide sport. And so Edward Wilson, he had many ideas. Um, What were some of the more outlandish proposals? Yeah, um, 
Yeah, Wilson described himself as a thorough acclimatizer, as a way of kind of dis- differentiating from the, own, the society, the rest of the society which he founded. Um, he was in, even in favor of things like um, monkeys, which he thought would make an excellent kind of visual distraction um, around suburban Melbourne. Right. Fortunately, the rest of the society were against monkeys, but it didn't stop people um, shipping the monkeys. But um, to the 1880s, every time they were shipped a monkey, they destroyed it. So that was one of the failures of the acclimatization society. Yeah, well, that was a self-regulated failure because they did not want monkeys everywhere. What was uh, what- what were some of their big successes? Uh, well, defining success as um, successfully established in the wild, you'd have to say red deer, roe deer, um, samba deer, um, Indian miners, sparrows, hares, brown trout, rainbow trout. They're kind of the big ones. All right. Well, we'll talk more about those in a minute. Um, so it seems in Victoria... Uh, and Melbourne in particular, for those of you from Melbourne, you, you, everyone knows Royal Park. It seems like Royal Park played a pretty pivotal role in this, this, this start of the acclimatisation movement in, in Australia and Edward Wilson's role in it. Can you tell me a bit more about the role of Royal Park? Yep. Um, Royal Park, um, those of you who don't know, is just kind of the edge of kind of the CBD in Melbourne and it's kind of a large area of parkland and a big chunk of it was granted to the acclimatization society as their depot so animals would arrive in Australia live for a few years in the park reproduce and then be um, distributed into the wild and this site later becomes the site of Melbourne Zoo because the acclimatization society in fact turns into the zoological society in fact the official name of the melbourne zoo till the 1970s was still the zoological and climatization society wow i i didn't i didn't know that until i read your book i think a lot of people would be quite surprised at those early origins of Hmm. the melbourne zoo so um maybe to How does um, Edward Wilson um, build on the work done overseas, but perhaps maybe make it a little bit different to what's happening in Australia? Um, How did did what Edward Wilson promote um, differ from international acclimatization societies? Well, I think the things that Edward Wilson um, achieved was direct government support. So um, granting the land, granting thousands of pounds a year from the Victorian government to the, um, the acclimatization society, but also he organised with the Secretary of the State of the Colonies in the UK to get free shipment of all acclimatization um, society animals on Navy ships. So he makes it practical in many ways. He's kind of the kind of a, the great organiser is the guys in everything what making things talk- happen <laughs> sorry what years are we talking about when this uh, we're talking about starting in about 1860 1861 okay so and continuing to about 1880 it, is it true that if edward wilson didn't play this major part maybe a lot of this uh, these acclimatization societies may not have um, formed in, as in such, with such vigour. Yeah, I think without Wilson, I think we still would have had the movement in Australia, but it wouldn't have been as well funded. It wouldn't have been as well organised. He had extensive connections all over the British Empire through his newspaper business. Yeah, it just would never have been as successful without Wilson. And this movement through Edward Wilson also worked in reverse. They seem to be very keen on exporting some of our native animals overseas. Um, Can you give some examples of where this was done? Uh, Sure. Um, So the French society actually had a reward in place if you could successfully export kangaroos or emus to France 
and they would pay a 500 franc reward if you could then get them to breed for two generations in France. And they then attempted to move some of these emus to Algeria. Um, there was also e attempts to um, uh, export Murray cod to um, uh, the United Kingdom, um, but they never survived because they'd die when they got to the equal um, when they got to the equator. But there was also, say, kookaburras exported to New Caledonia. I understand they even tried to export the wombat. Is that right? Um, yeah, they did to, uh, do a little bit with work with wombats, but mainly as kind of as a commodity. Like, if we give you three wombats, will you give us six deer? So, like, as an in kind trade. So, you know, way of making your cash go further because you would just trade in animals rather than money. It's quite extraordinary. Well, for those that have joined us, um, we're here for the inaugural Aliens Among Us seminar Q&A. And we've got Dr. Pete Minard, whose book is All Things Harmless, Useful and Ornamental. Um, just a reminder, if you've got a question down the bottom of your screen, you've got the Q&A button, hit that, ask your question. We've had a few come in. I might just um, deal with them a bit later on as we start to sort of talk a bit more about how the acclimatization society has worked. Um, I might just move on a bit now, Pete. Um, we've talked about Edward Wilson, who seemed to be quite... Um, quite fundamental in the formation of the acclimatization society in Victoria in particular, but there were some other thinkers as well. Um, Edward Wilson re was, had to go return back to, to England. He was originally from England, I imagine, for some um, medical emergency. Yeah, he was going blind. He was going blind. So what effect did his departure have on the movement? Um, in Victoria? I think um, his departure in their terms made what they, they kind of rationalised. All right. We're not having any, we're not introducing any predators. We're not, by their perspective, anything that's an agricultural pest. So it becomes more focused on food and things that can survive in the wild, where Wilson was more take everything and then we'll see what happens. Josh, what is such a dangerous thinking? Yeah. So some of the people who were became increasingly prominent in the movement at that stage, as I've been reading in your book about Frederick McCoy, and he seemed to have uh, an unusual theory of evolution. Do you want to talk about Frederick McCoy? Yeah. So Frederick McCoy um, was the first professor of natural science at the University of Melbourne. He was kind of their chief zoological advisor to the Acclimatization Society. And he was kind of profoundly anti-Darwin. So he was anti-evolutionist. Instead, he believed in following a guy named Lewis Agassiz in the States, um, this idea of multiple zones of creation. That yes, animals changed over time, but they weren't, they did not involve as so, so much as. So you would have a zone of creation in Africa, a zone of creation in Australasia, and that, and you have similar animals with similar ecological niches in these areas. So they would have an emu in Australia, an ostrich in Africa, and you could go, all right, emu survive in Australia, so ostriches will survive in Australia. So you use climate sort of as the way of working out which species should be introduced where, is that right? Yeah, so it uses, builds on the word of Alexander von Humboldt and kind of looks at um, latitude and longitude as a kind of rough equivalency of climate and what will survive in one similar climate on the other side of the equator. Did they honestly believe they were trying to improve nature? What, 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 was, what, was, what was going on in their minds that was justifying this? Um, yes. In a, in a word, yes. They definitely thought they could... They saw absences in Australia. Like, why is there no cloven-hooded um, creatures? Why is there no deer? But they also saw that um, Australian colonisation had already damaged, say, the rivers. So you've got to remember this is immediately post the um, Australian gold rush and they'd already noticed things like um, 
Australian blackfish were becoming rarer. And they had this idea that it would be easier to replace the blackfish with, say, trout or um, English perch, known as redfin here, rather than um, breed up the blackfish. So they thought they could just replace with equivalents when um, species started to disappear. So they were trying to correct one, if you like, mistake of colonisation with, with another and, and thought they were uh, leaving a better environment in its place. Yeah, pretty much. And they were also very much interested in controlling um, agricultural pests. So bringing things like sparrows, Indian miners, to control plagues of locusts, which they felt was um, coming because that colonization had upset the balance of nature. And they very much believed in this whole process as just kind of part of the process of colonization of the British Empire. Because after all, what is colonization? What is having a colony except moving people, animals, and plants to other places and extracting other organisms? Like it's kind of just part of the logic of the empire. Wow, yeah. Now, George Bennett was another figure of, the, of this time. Um, how was he different to the acclimatizations before him? Well, uh, George Bennett was largely New South Wales based, and he, um, but he also published in, he's an honorary member of the Victorian Society and published extensively. But he kind of introduced this idea of selective protection of Australian animals should be part of the acclimatization movement that it's not just enough to introduce new animals, you should protect useful Australian animals like kookaburras because they kill snakes. But it shouldn't be thought of as directly equivalent to any of our environmental protection because they also, say, believed in things like um, putting a bounty on wedge-tailed eagles and dingoes. Mm. So it's kind of a, they believed in selective protection of Australian wildlife. Quite extraordinary. Well, um, this period, um, I mean, uh, 1959 was when Charles Darwin published his Origin of Species. So the influence of that was percolating through the scientific establishment around the world. So there's another figure that features in this period of acclimatization societies, Dr. Henry Madden. And he seemed like, um, he seemed to take Darwin's theory very seriously and was uh, accommodated, surprisingly, in the acclimatization movement. Yeah. Um, so how did Dr. Madden, what did he try to bring to the acclimatization society uh, thinking? Well, um, uh, Darwinian scientists were scientists were very controversial in uh, the Australian colonies, but he was a strict believer in it. And he thought that... Um, Basically, colonization had upset the struggle for existence, which is kind of a key Darwinian term. And you could correct the, or refocus this struggle, um, replace animals that were gone or missing with new species. So he, the entire climatization movement becomes kind of neutral on the idea of Darwinian evolution. You don't have to accept evolution to participate you don't have to reject it you just have to accept the idea that plants and animals should be moved around the world yeah right so i mean i've i've just got a question that's come in for, actually before we started um, about this um because the question from louise elliott is to what extent did the acclimatizations the acclimatizers subscribe to the evolutionary theory of and how did it affect how they framed their work? Um, you sort of answered it, but do you want to expand on that? Yeah, like, as I said, it's it's very much a, they were very much neutral on um, uh, uh, evolutionary theory, um, but, you could, but you could also see, say, the French acclimatization society very much believed in Lamarckian evolution. So they thought if you introduced an animal to a new environment, its descendants could adapt genetically um, to the new environment. But later on, when we're talking about the shutting down the acclimatization society, Darwinian thinking comes involved in the 1880s. 
um, both to explain how things have gone so horribly wrong with sparrows and such like, but also the idea that Australian animals, because they've been so isolated from the rest of the world, are evolutionarily vulnerable to exploitation. So it's part of the idea Darwinian thinking gets thought in how they shut themselves down in the 1880s. That's really interesting. So do you think that theory, Darwin's theory, actually helped hasten the decline of their climatization societies? Eventually. I think it was both involved in establishing it and when they started to think of Australian animals as vulnerable um, and they were doing kind of collaborations with the Field Naturalists Club in Victoria and doing things like um, helping establish um, Wilson's Promontory National Park. There's this idea that we need to protect Australian animals from European animals. But this also gets caught up with some disturbing racialized understanding of Darwinian theory at the time. It's not coincidental that they thought European animals were superior. Like this yeah. is caught up in a sense of general European superiority and that Indigenous Australia was vulnerable on all levels. Yeah, okay. Now, one of the final figures for this period that I wanted to touch on, um, Ferdinand Mueller. I think many Victorians would, will, 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 I think, um, be embarrassed to, to know about him because he was the Victorian government botanist, yep. famous for having sprinkled um, blackberry seeds wherever he travelled throughout the state as, you know, to help, help their spread. Um, but he played a big role too in acclimatisation in the 60s and 70s. Now, while he's a botanist and the work of the acclimatization societies did focus on animals, um, tell me a bit about how Ferdinand Mueller influenced um, the acclimatization movement. Well, for, firstly, in Victoria, he just kind of took the plant acclimatization off the hands of the acclimatization society and just ran it through the botanical gardens. That's part of the reason the book doesn't talk about it so much because um, he operates outside of the formal channels. But he also, he was a believer that forests created climate, that you could, um, if you could extensively afforestate an area, you could change the local rainfall patterns and then you could have, say, um, subtropical animals um, become established along, say, the course of the Murray. Yeah, okay. Well, um, I've just got another question that's come in for this section. Um, it's from Steve Taylor. I'm not sure if it's uh, entirely relevant. You might actually help me here, Pete. Um, yeah. Was there pushback from the Gould League Society to what the Acclimatisation Society was doing? Um, Gould League Society, I think, is a bit later, but we did have... Um, uh, a bit of pushback from the Field Naturalist Club of Victoria, but also cooperation between the Field Naturalists and the Climatization Society of Victoria. They had a lot of dual membership. They worked out together lists of native animals that should be protected, what the closed seasons should be. Yeah. Okay, so there was some overlap there. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, just a reminder, any questions? Just pop it into the Q&A um, part of this. You know, press that button and into that screen. If that had to come in, um, I might just look at some of the particular animals that you've sort of touched on already. Um, you talked a bit about the sparrows that you look out the window and see today. Um, why on earth did they think introducing sparrows and even Indian miners was such a good thing to um, for the acclimatization societies? Uh, sure, they thought the colonisation had da damaged the local um, balance of nature and they were dealing with what they thought of as plagues of locusts, caterpillars, such like, and they felt that um, in Europe, in particular, sparrows um, acted as basically a form of biological control, um, destroying... Um, caterpillars and such like, and this was very much a, the opinion of the French scientists at the time. If they'd actually talked to any English or French farmers, they would have told them, yes, they do eat grubs, but only when they're raising their young. Mm 
The rest of the time, they in fact eat grain and they are an agricultural pest in themselves. Uh, Indian miners had got a um, reputation in um, the British India as a kind of pest control species. And that from there, they were introduced to Mauritius and Jamaica, other British colonies, and they kind of further enhanced their reputation for pest control. And then they were introduced to Australia directly from Calcutta, but also from Mauritius. That was easy because the governor of Victoria, Henry Barclay, went from being a governor of Victoria to governor of Mauritius. So there was easy lines of exchange there. Yeah, right. And just explain exactly how they do these introductions. They don't just introduce one or two or just a breeding pair. How do they make sure these species actually do come and become established? Uh, sure. They would generally spend a few years, say, breeding them up in an aviary at Royal Park, and then they would experimentally let um, at least some out in sympathizers' farms. And this is where, um, uh, like, more participation from the broader public, um, more farming women um, get involved in the process as well. Like, um, all right, if you can bring me one possum which we can exchange with New Zealand, we will give you 10 sparrows. And you're like, I, I have family connections to Benalla and I saw some sparrows there and it's like, I think I know which family introduced these and they're still in the district. Oh, I won't tell anyone and it's not in the book because they would then become most disliked amongst the other family farmers. There's a few dark secrets in our current situation. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Well, I can't help but wanting to talk about deer because, uh, I mean, deer did take a little while to actually spread widely, mm. but the acclimatization had a really important role in their introduction. So what was their role? Um, there was already some small scale introduction of say roe deer and red deer before acclimatization got involved, but they're largely responsible for introducing um, India, Indian deer and de uh, deer from the Malayan Peninsula. So Samba, hog deer and this like, and they would exchange them Australian animals. They would get a breeding population going up in Royal Park. Then they'd send them to a farm where they'd breed more um, further and then they'd kind of introduce them to the wild where they were trying to kind of be a food supply for colonists. Was, was the government funding all of this or was it just done through philanthropy? or, or um, A lot of government funding and a lot of in-kind in exchange. So like say um, the British Zoological Society, the British Zoo was very keen to get involved because they had someone who would collect a Australian animals for them. So like the amount of possums, the amount of koalas that went through the acclimatization society's um, depot just as a commodity so that you could, um, yeah, exchange three koalas for six deer. So they were a sort of an early form of a zoo, but in a very, with a very different. Um, yeah. Yeah, like they, they would not release or collect any predators until the 1880s when they got their um, first tigers and leopards, but they were never intended for release. So there is no connection to the whole big cat conspiracy because they never released any big cats into the wild. And in fact, till the 1880s, if anyone introduced, gave them a predator, they'd basically shoot it. So they did have some limits on what they would try to introduce. Yeah, they're Thanks. just not our limits. <laughs> wow. Okay. And um, the introduction of deer into Victoria wasn't simply driven by the Acclimatization Society as well. And the introduction wasn't without disagreements. Tell me a bit about how the hunters and in the Acclimatization Society people interacted. Yeah, sure. Um, you'd think at first that um, the hunters and like hunt clubs would be directly sympathizing with the Acclimatization Society. But in many ways, they were at cross purposes. Um, they both believed in um, introducing deer, but the acclimatization also very strongly believed that all animals are public property, that you cannot own the right to hunt deer. Even if you introduce the animal, it is the property of the Victorian people. That, so they didn't want to introduce 
reproduced precisely the game practices from England, where, say, the Lord of the Manor had the right to hunt deer and other kind of super wealthy people like the Austins in Geelong, the Churnsides in what's now Werribee, very much wanted to kind of introduce deer as base, basic way of becoming pseudo-aristocrats. So you had sort of competing forces introducing different deer, did you? Um, sometimes they were introducing the same deer. Sometimes the acclimatization society would give them a few. And, but under this, the acclimatization still understood it, that this is the people's deer and the big pastoralists they gave it to, well, they've been eating my hay for the last five years. This is my deer. <laughs> Only my friends can hunt it. Okay. Well, wow, okay. Yeah, so obviously there's plenty of deer around now, so I think anyone who wants deer, they can, they can have it. And hmm. <laughs> now fish seem to be an important part of uh, the acclimatization society as well. Um, what, I'm thinking about trout in particular. Why was that so important to the early acclimatization society? Sure. Um, at first, it was, in fact, salmon that were, was important to, to um, and they were trying to create in Victoria and in Tasmania a commercial salmon industry. They were going to kind of replace the, the, the grayling that were gone, the blackfish that were gone, with commercially harvestable quantities of salmon. Um, the salmon, uh, very difficult to get them to breed or only a few of them would survive. So it was difficult to get them to establish in the wild. But almost coincidentally, uh, the first couple of ships with salmon eggs in them also sent over brown trout eggs, which did much better and were then established in Australia. And once they're here, there is an established market for say, recreational anglers. But the original idea was to create a commercial fishery. It's just that salmon didn't survive, trout did, and there's a kind of a long tradition of trout fishing uh, within the British Isles. Okay, so the original goal was, was salmon, but they, the trout was uh, where they did succeed very, yep. very, very successfully. And they could sell trout and trout eggs to the public, so it gives another um, revenue stream. A revenue stream and it would have made them very popular as well yes it did um because there was a feeling that australian fish don't rise to the fly that's not actually true but certainly they wanted to not just fish they wanted to reproduce kind of the cultural traditions of uh, british fishing in australia and in new zealand i understand you collect fish you have a few fish tanks of your own yeah, about five or six. <laughs> um, yeah, I tried actually tried raising trout in one big tank last year, but it got a bit too hot and they died. <laughs> okay, so your, your efforts weren't great. What? <laughs> I was never going to let them out in the wild. <laughs> well, what would happen if we stopped stopping the, the, the streams with trout today? Um, I mean, yeah. are they really invasive? Well, that's just one of those interesting questions. When does an alien non-native species become an invasive? And while there are some points in Victoria and New South Wales where uh, trout can reproduce, it's mainly like to keep them at a recreational fishing level so you can go and reliably catch some, we have to keep introducing them. So if we wanted to reduce them to, say, they'd always still be here, I don't think we'd ever eradicate them, but to a much smaller level, all we need to do is stop stocking them because then at the absolute end of their temperature range for reproduction in most Australian rivers. So it's like, this is one of these few instances where we're, what we're actually dealing with here is continued acclimatization. And don't get me wrong. I mean, the trout have caused a massive impact on our streams and uh, the extinction of many species. But I think the interesting thing to think about is how that they, I guess their survival uh, in many places needs to be sustained by uh, human intervention. Mm. Um, I, it, you mentioned, you touched on the Australian grayling and um, there was concern about its decline. Um, and that was one of the motivations for introducing uh, other fish. 
Does that signal a bit of a change of thinking of the climatization society? Um, from very early on, they were interested in protecting um, Australian native fish. But as the 1880s wore on and there was kind of a generational change in the acclimatization society, they started to value Australian fish and Australian animals for their own sake. We value them because they're unique, not because they're tasty. So there's, there's always been an interest in fish protection. So they do things like you can't take some of the first laws of you can't take small fish. You can't fish for um, fish outside of an establishing breeding season they're involved in. And that got further extended to kind of all Australian fish rather than just the kind of commercially sought ones. Yeah, very interesting. Um, I'm just thinking about the questions we've had so far. I don't know sure. questions have come in, but um, there is one, and maybe this is time to ask it, from an M. Norman. Um, He's asking about arum lilies. Now, I know we've been talking about wildlife and um, look, you may not know much about this, Pete, but he's talking about arum lilies that we introduce into the gardens of Southwest Western Australia, which is, they now become yeah. a major bushland weed. Just wondered whether you've covered the introduction of, you've thought about and seen evidence of the climatization societies in um, promoting the introduction of um, invasive plants like the arum lily. Um, I saw, certainly saw them involved with things like blackberries. They're definitely involved with kind of promoting uh, conifer forestry in Australia. Um, but I didn't. my research didn't really focus on the plants. Uh, to answer one of the other questions, uh, the Queensland, Queensland Climatisation Society did focus almost entirely on plants and kind of turned into a subset of the Queensland Botanical Gardens and they were responsible for say uh, establishing the first mango plantations in, in Queensland say from India but also kind of the domestication of the macadamia nut Australian nut and exporting that elsewhere. Okay it's um, yeah because I've just I've just realized there are a few more questions Adam Mute for example asked a question about plants uh, there's another question here from Mike Hall. Um, was there any pushback at the time against this movement? And what was the reaction of Indigenous Australians to these new creatures? Um, pushback largely came from small farmers who would say have to deal with hares and um, sparrows on their land that were there and acting as pests and they weren't legally allowed to shoot. Um, when I was looking for Indigenous perspectives, I saw um, Indigenous people working as collectors, say um, they would survive, um, supply, say, um, bush turkey chicks and um, emu chicks for sale overseas. Um, interestingly enough, when you're talking about things like rabbits, there's an interest of Indigenous people as, a, as, as them as a food supply. So there's kind of some really complex uh, relationships here with Indigenous people. But I think that would be a whole second book that I haven't had time to write. Yes, that, that would be a really interesting book. Um, just, just the summing up around what the motivations of the acclimatizations were, because if, another question came in about um, from Mike Hall. Um, it wasn't necessarily simply trying to rec recreate New Britain, was it? It, was, it? it had multiple multiple motivations, but it was a little bit different. Yeah, um, you got to more think of it as recreating the best animals of all of the British Empire in Australia. Um, a lot of the people involved in the acclimatization society had lived in India, Mauritius, uh, Malay colonies before coming to Australia. And Britain itself meant very little to them. The British Empire, however, was the centre of their identity. So they, um, it looks like, if we just take from the results backwards, that they were interested in turning Australia into England. But that's largely because they were able to get um, kind of a large supply of, say, um, red deer, English trout. So it's kind of an artefact of what they were able to get 
if you look at their lists of what they're trying, what they were trying to achieve, it's mainly Indian and African animals. They just had to say they couldn't get um, a large enough supply of, say, oryx type of antelope to ever breed in Australia. So the intent was more the best of the British Empire or I've even seen in Ferdinand von Mueller's stuff, trancing forming Australia into a new India rather than a new Britain. New India. Gosh. Hmm. And a new South Africa and a a new whatever. Yeah. (laughs) Well, we've sort of explored a bit about this growing movement in the 60s and 70s and even through the 80s. But then it seemed to collapse relatively quickly, the movement. Um, So what forces were at play that actually helped bring about this decline of the acclimatization movement in the turn of the century? I mean, at at the same time, you've you've touched on the rabbits and their devastating impacts as they spread across the continent they had. Was it simply the realization that there was a pretty tragic mistakes made and um, they're on the wrong side of history or or what forced them to uh, decline? Um, It's kind of a multiple elements. There was the element of this has gone horribly wrong. particularly with sparrows and hares, like they were the first things that were thought to have gone wrong. Um, The climatization society always disavowed any involvement with rabbits. It's not quite true. They didn't introduce rabbits, but they did kind of help spread them around the country. But the rabbit plague does discredit them. It discredits the idea of moving um, new animals into the world, but also... They look at um, the government who were funding it. We have spent thousands upon thousands of pounds of this over the year. The the animals either died, disappeared like pheasants, never to be seen again, died in transport or became agricultural pests. And this with also coupled with a generational change in government and in the climatization society, we get people like um, Baldwin Spencer get involved and there's kind of a stronger ethic in protecting Australian nature. So they've always protected useful species, but then you can have um, things like they're protecting ibises, they're protecting parrots, things that are not deemed to have any kind of practical use. So they kind of shut themselves down because of their mistakes, they run out of money, they discover they can make more money as a zoo and they become dubious of the whole concept to start with. Uh, Andrew, I've lost you. Sorry, Pete, I was muted myself because there was some playing outside. So I've noticed there's some still acclimatization societies uh, around today, um, but the only ones I know of are, are really effectively trout fishing clubs. Yeah. There's one in, uh, in the, the Monero Acclimatization Society, for example, was actually we're working with them on uh, trying to do something about the feral horses in Kosciuszko. So is that the only form that the acclimatization societies have now? Um, yeah, like there's there's the Orange acclimatize, Fish Acclimatization. There's the Ballarat Fish Acclimatization Society in, um, well, in Ballarat. It's actually just down the road from me. It's where I got my trout. Um, but... The acclimatization societies in both New South Wales and Victoria transformed themselves into zoos. Like they became Melbourne and New South Wales Zoo, originally as just a way of subsidizing acclimatization. You can charge people to see the tiger and we can spend that money on deer. But over time, the, um, the zoo element of it that we understand today became more and more prominent and they kind of ceased all the climatization except for trout. So if you go to Melbourne Zoo, in some ways you're seeing the remnants of the climatization society. Right. And is there something we can take away from this, this, this period that's a positive? They, they did some good work that maybe we can um, thank them for if, if, <laughs> if, if we, we can. Yeah. Um, I think one of the kind of key legacies is kind of the first legislation to protect Australian native animals. They only wanted to protect useful ones, but they did do a lot of scientific 
it's through a lot of scientific research. Um, well, when is it safe to fish for native fish? When do um, fish birds breed in Australia? So they did a lot of kind of primary scientific research about Australia, understanding Australian animals. But on the more philosophical perspective, I think it teaches this caution about introduced species, but also to remind us that all scientific um, hypothesis theories are provisional. They operated on the best science of the day and it went horribly wrong. So just kind of a scientific humility is something we should learn from them. That's a really good lesson, a good lesson to take away. Um, I noticed that most of the men, or all, all of the people we touched on were, were male. Um, was this a, a male movement or were there women actually involved? Uh, there was more women involved in the British society. Uh, Lady Burdett Coots, one of the richest women in um, England who didn't have a title. She was a member of the British society. Uh, you can see women involved in collecting animals um, for export and sign it like helping say sparrows reproduce on their farm. But it was it was never never written anywhere that it was a men only society, but I never found a female member. Yeah, right. Okay. Well, um, we've, I think we've gone through all the questions. Um, thanks, Darius Kedros. I think we've touched on, on your question about turning the tide. Um, so I think we're coming near, to near the end now, Pete. Um, and I'm just thinking about you, your book and the way you both, you both open the book and you close the book. And mm. you... When you wrote the, the the epilogue, you were sitting having a coffee in Royal Melbourne Zoo and um, thinking about the role that that zoo had in the early acclimatization society movement. So tell me about when you walk through Royal Park and when you have your next coffee in the zoo, what thoughts does it evoke? Uh, mm. now having written this book and having such an understanding, detailed understanding of the climatization movement in Victoria. Yeah. It's, it's very strange for me walking through the zoo because they very much do not talk about their origins of climatization. They talk about, they kind of ignore their history, even though they're involved of like some good things to protecting animals as well as their horrible mistakes. But also it makes me think of conservation it makes me a bit sceptical when I see, say, a Siberian tiger breeding program. It's like, where's the habitat for this animal? Where can it be released? There's more and more people in Siberia, in Sumatra. So it makes me think of, makes me a bit sceptical of zoos as conservation bodies because where are these animals going if they, if they truly are about breeding populations and there's more and more people destroying more and more habitat in the world. Mm. I mean, I think zoos have certainly come a long way and um, I mean, they're, they're major forces now in, in conservation efforts. We can't lose sight of the fact that it's the natural habitat that uh, is where we want our native species. Mm. I mean, so look, Thank you, Pete. It's been wonderful to read your book. It's been wonderful to talk to you today. So just a reminder, the book is All Things Harmless, Useful and Ornamental. It's published by University of North Carolina Press. Get your book. Apparently Amazon is the easiest one to get it from, but most other bookstores will have it. Yeah. Um, we're still planning, we're planning our next Aliens Among Us Q&A. We hope in the next couple of months uh, to have Another, another, another special guest. We want to draw on people from both in Australia, but even around the world. I guess this technology allows us to do that. Um, please, I might leave the seminar open just for a few minutes. If you've got any suggestions or send us an email as well about future guests we could have on the our, our Aliens Among Us series, um, we want to we want you to nominate your invasive species hero. So. Just finally, Pete, thanks for joining me today and um, hopefully we, we can talk to you more as you explore the environmental history of Australia.